Um, before we jump into some of the current legal topics that I'm hoping we can discuss, I wanted to touch on um, one aspect of your career that the Chief Justice mentioned, which was your service in the Army. Um, I think a lot of times when we hear about diversity on the bench, we talk a lot about race, we talk a lot about religion and what law school people went to, and we don't talk a lot about um, military service, and I think not a ton of judges have that background. Can you talk a little bit about um, how your time in the service maybe informed your time on the bench? I'd be happy to, Sarah. Um, I want to first uh, thank the chief for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, when I congratulated the chief on her appointment, she graciously said, my one regret was that our time did not overlap. I can always come back. <laughs> no, my golf game would suffer if I came back. So, uh, Sarah, my time in the um, military uh, was not unusual for any of the members of my undergraduate and law school class because many of us at USF went through ROTC which meant that after four years, we had a commitment, a two-year commitment to the Army. Um, the ROTC commitment was uh, in incredible. Uh, I went up to uh, Fort Lewis, uh, Washington, um, with uh, ROTC students from all over the country and met some of my uh, uh, high school classmates at the uh, summer camp. And one of them was the star of the football team and the best athlete in the school. And he looked at the ratings on the uh, uh, physical aspects of summer camp and saw my name up there at the top. <laughs> and, and he came up and congratulated me. So I did not have those attributes when I was in high school. But uh, the military experience for me was a good one. Uh, I got a deferment to go to law school, and then uh, when I came out of law school, Uncle Sam said, it's time. So um, I uh, went into the Army uh, and served at Fort Benjamin Harrison, Fort Lewis, Washington, and then uh, Fort Carson, Colorado. So I had three assignments in a very short period of time because I, at, in, in, uh, at Fort Lewis, I was in charge of what they call a transfer station. This is the station that processes all of the incoming and outgoing soldiers to Vietnam. So I knew well that I was sending a lot of young men out of the country that would not come back. And I had the responsibility of welcoming those back who had already served their tour of duty in Vietnam. I got notice when I was at, uh, I was in charge of a transfer station. I was a first lieutenant. This was a major, uh, this was a spot for a major in the uh, US Army. So I had some serious responsibility. And this transfer station operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There were no weekends. It was like being back on the farm. But um, I got uh, my orders to go to Vietnam out of uh, Fort Lewis. But I was activated as a unit from Fort Carson, Colorado. The 3rd Brigade of the 5th Division was going to move it as a unit to replace the 3rd Mar Marine Division at a place called Quang Tri which is seven miles south of the DMZ. Now, maybe you want me to shorten this up a little bit. It's your interview. <laughs> uh, so I uh, still remember uh, landing at uh, the Quang Tri Airport. This was not really an airport. It was kind of in the middle of the woods that they carved this uh, landing strip out of. And the C-130 130 landed, and a tank was set in the middle, and we were on either side of the tank. The pilot comes on and says, the 
airstrip is under attack. So we are going to offload quickly you to the rear of the airplane, and we are going to take off. So don't be slow. So um, that was my uh, welcome to, uh, to Vietnam. But I had a, uh, I lived in a tent for six months. Now, just to show you how remarkable this process was, we moved 5,000 men and 2,000 vehicles from Fort Carson, Colorado to Quang Tri, Vietnam. We were operational in one week. Now, as a civilian, we'd still be looking for our toothbrush. But it, it was a remarkable experience. And I gained immense respect for the military, for the US military in particular, um, and the way it operates under very difficult circumstances. It was a uh, life-changing experience. I met young men from every race, color, or creed. They didn't care what color your skin was. They just wanted to know if you could be counted on when the going got tough. So I really appreciated my time in the military. And there were so many out of my law school class in Vietnam at the same time that we had a reunion at the US Army headquarters, New Year's Day, 1969. So uh, that was my military experience. Wow. You told an interviewer in 2019 um, that you didn't think an Asian judge would ever be appointed to the court, and that when you were growing up, you didn't think it was even possible for an Asian American to be a judge. Can you talk about why that was, and what did you think when Justice Kennard was appointed to the court? Well, the reason I thought that was because of the numbers. There were very few Asian lawyers there were even fewer Asian judges. When I was appointed to the Alameda Superior Court, there was one other Asian judge. When I was appointed to the Supreme Court, Joyce Kennard was the only Asian member of the court. So I'll, I'll just tell you a story uh, in uh, 1988. Uh, I was in communication with Marv Baxter, who was then the appointment secretary. Um, and Marv asked me if I was interested in becoming a judge. And I said, well, maybe someday, but uh, I've committed to being president of the Alameda County Bar Association, and I want to see that commitment through. Um, it got, uh, by, the, by about halfway through my tenure as president of the bar, I told Carol, I've got to put my name in for the bench. And I told Carol these exact words, chances are nothing will happen but I have to try. So I'm not very informed about how this process works, but uh, I really uh, did, just because of the numbers, I didn't think it would be possible to become uh, a, uh, uh, a judge. But I will tell you about my interview with Marv Baxter. Uh, he escorted me into his office, which was, as Dan knows, Dan worked for uh, Governor Wilson when I was appointed. So he, Marv was in the horseshoe, and his office was very close to the governor's. So Marv escorts me into his uh, 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 office, and uh, he has this thick binder in front of him, and he opens it, and he starts uh, uh, asking me questions. After about 10 minutes, he slams the binder shut, and he says, I can't do this anymore. Okay, I, I was about to stand up and say, it's nice to see you again as well. See you soon. Marv got this broad grin on his face that all of you who know him would recognize. And he said, the governor has already approved your appointment. I'm just going through the motions. <laughs> so, and then, of course, he told me that uh, I couldn't tell anyone other than Carol and our children. Um, but he opens the door uh, to his reception area, and there stands Chief Justice Malcolm Lucas and Justice Ed Pinelli from the California Supreme Court. And Marv says, I suppose we can trust these two with this information. Um, but that, that's a long answer to uh, uh, why I didn't think it would be possible 
for an Asian, it, it, it would very, it'd be very unlikely for an Asian American to be appointed to the bench, but I told Carol, it probably will not happen, but I have to try. Boy, am I glad I tried. Would love to have an interview like that, wow. Um, as I was researching um, you know, some questions for this interview, I came across an op-ed piece that you wrote in 2018 about judicial independence. Mm -hmm. And you included a quote from Sandra Day O'Connor that said, the breadth and intensity of rage currently being leveled at the judiciary may be unmatched in American history. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty amusing because it was five years ago and we're in you know, a much different place right now. So do you think that that's even more true now? And to what extent do you think any of that is self-inflicted? I think it is more true now, unfortunately. I think uh, we are in a time of crisis, but Sandra Day O'Connor was uh, one of my uh, heroes. Um, I really appreciated all the work that she did in the area of judicial independence. Justice O'Connor and I were on a panel at Stanford on the day of homecoming, and I thought, this is going to be an empty room because everyone's going to be at the football game. The room was packed because they were there to hear Justice O'Connor. Uh, she was a leader in the uh, fight for judicial independence. Uh, I think she said judicial independence could be lost in an instant and it will be very, very hard to replace it. So if anyone out there is working to make sure that we continue to have independent judges, please continue to do that because it is so important for each of your practices and each of your lives. I will tell you just a side story about Justice O'Connor. Uh, when I was asked to teach DNA at the FBI Academy, I wrote to three Supreme Court justices, Justice O'Connor, Justice Scalia, and Justice Kennedy. All of them said, sure, come on in. So I went in to see uh, all of them, but I'll tell you the O'Connor story. Uh, she was so gracious with her time, and at about 5 o'clock she looked at your watch, and I thought she was going to say, I'm sorry, but your time is up. She said, have you been to the Vatican exhibit in the Library of Congress? And I said, no, I'm sorry, I missed that, Your Honor. And she said, oh, just wait a minute. So she dials her phone. She gets the Library of Congress open so that I can go see the Vatican exhibit. What a gracious lady. Yeah, the, the judges but I, don't I also want to tell you, Chief, that Sandra Day O'Connor and my law partner, Fred Cummings, we're in the same class at Stanford. Um, you and Chief Justice Ron George faced some aggressive opposition in your retention election, I think the first one that you faced. Um, can you talk about what that experience was like and how it shaped your view of those retention elections? Do you think it's a better system than having contested elections? Oh, yeah, if, if you'd asked me that question the day after the retention <laughs> election finished and vote, I would have said, oh, we should throw this thing out. I don't want any part of it. But on re reflection, um, I think our system is a good one. Uh, it's certainly better than having contested elections. I mean, when you hear what's happening in Wisconsin, uh, you have a 4-3, they run as... Party, as party candidates, are you, and they're not the only state that does that. It's, uh, I, I would not want to wish that on California. I think our system is the best, or maybe the worst, except for all of the others. <laughs> there, 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 is, there is a uh, part of it that gives the people the right to have some say, but it's not a contested party election. It's yes or no on the ballot. Now, Ron George and I, because of the uh, uh, majority uh, uh, abortion case, uh, received uh, a lot of opposition. And we actually met with Governor Wilson. I think Dan was there. 
uh, and uh, the governor said, you have to mount campaigns. And I said, oh, great. So we did. Um, I frankly think that it probably would have had the same result had we not, looking back, but maybe not because, you know, Pete Wilson was very attuned uh, politically. Uh, and I think because Ron George and I mounted campaigns, mounted serious campaigns, we each raised almost a million dollars. And if somebody at the beginning of that campaign said, Chin, you have to raise a million dollars, I would have said, I'm out of here. But I'm glad that I did it. Um, and I, I met people from all over the state. I talked about the importance of having independent judges and not judges that raise their hands to test the political wins. We cannot have that. We don't have that in California. Uh, and I think because we don't have partisan elections, but we have a retention election, that we are better off for it. So uh, I uh, hope that no one else has to go through what Ron George and I had to go through. Um, but I learned a lot from it. Although in that uh, campaign, Ron, in the middle of the campaign, says to me, Ming, I want you to run again in 12 years. And I said, Ron, can we get through this one first? So 12 years comes around, and Ron says, I'm not running. So I ran without him, did not make any telephone calls, did not talk to any of the press, did not raise a nickel, and I got the same number of votes. I called Ron George and said, Ron, it was a lot easier to run without you. <laughs> um, California's Supreme Court used to be ideologically divided over a lot of issues, the death penalty, consumer issues, civil rights. There were a lot of 4-3 rulings, I'm sure many of which you were part of. Now the rulings are frequently unanimous. And can you talk about how does the court reach unanimity so often? And do you think it's a good thing or are sometimes dissenting voices kind of silenced in that process? I, I, Sarah, I recognize that question uh, from Bob because he wanted to talk about that. And I told him, I will talk about that by relating a story that the entire court, when Ron George was chief, uh, we had lunch with Justice Stephen Breyer. Mm -hmm. He was up here visiting, up in San Francisco, visiting with his brother Chuck, who was on the uh, uh, federal district court. Um, and we had a very eye-opening um, lunch where we traded our processes, and Justice Breyer outlined the processes that they use at the US Supreme Court. So bear with me. I'm going to try to summarize this in a uh, nutshell because I think it explains the reason there is some unanimity on the California Supreme Court. And Justice Carrero, Chief Justice Guerrero can chime in if she thinks <laughs> that I'm off base, but uh, bear with me. Uh, at the US Supreme Court, Justice Breyer says that they don't talk to each other about the cases before oral argument. Our process is just the opposite. We send out a calendar memo. Either the chief writes it or the uh, chambers to whom the chief assigns the case writes it. Everyone turns in preliminary responses. I concur. I concur with reservations. If this becomes the opinion of the court, I will dissent. So everyone checks in early on as to where they stand on that case. That case isn't even set until it has at least four votes for something. Usually, the chief waits until everyone has checked in on their responses. Now, chief, I won't air all the dirty laundry and, and talk about chambers that are slow and don't pay attention to all the deadlines that the court has. I followed them to the letter because I thought it was really important for the court to get its work done on time and efficiently. So it's very important for that court to run efficiently for everyone to get their PRs in on time. You have 30 days to do it. Come on. That's enough time. Get it. Get your homework done. So 
Uh, the chambers are talking about that case. And by the time it gets to oral argument, everyone knows what the positions are on each of the justices. So we know where the weaknesses are, we know where the strengths are, and we're talking about them. This is long before the case is set for oral argument. We also have the 90-day rule. Once the case is submitted, it has to be filed within 90 days. So you can't be sitting around on the day of oral argument and not having talked to anybody and not know where anyone is on, on these cases. So I think that's one of the major reasons why we have more unanimity. It's because of the process, but it is also because of the people who are there. We were all trained very well. We could disagree, but don't be disagreeable about it. It makes for a much better working environment. When I talked to the chief this afternoon, I said, how is everything going? And she said, you know what a wonderful group of people I have to work with. And I had the same experience for all 24 and a half years on the court. I worked with talented, bright, hardworking people. Whenever we disagreed, we never took it personally. I, I, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, one, one case, and the reason I want to talk about it is that uh, it illustrates uh, the uh, camaraderie among the uh, members of, of the court. Um, there's a case that Bob and I were going to mention, and it's uh, People versus Ariaga. Now, you, none of you have heard of this case, but I actually wrote it when I was on the Court of Appeal. Stanley Moss wrote the uh, unanimous majority. He put quotes around my opinion and said, we can't say it any better than that. I'm not sure that it has ever happened, but I was so proud of that. And I was so attached to Stanley Moss by the time I got to the court. By the way, we used to play tennis together, so there are other reasons other than our uh, legal writing uh, where we agreed. Uh, I also remember a concurring opinion that I wrote in, in Goose, and it was about summary judgment and how summary judgment ought to be handled. Uh, and about seven years later, Stanley writes Atlantic Richfield, and he says, Chin got it right in Goose. You have to wait seven years, <laughs> but you, you have to be patient when you're on the court. But I think that gives you a uh, flavor of why the California Supreme Court uh, does not march off in, in a huff every time they have a disagreement. So I think we have that history behind us, and I'm so happy to hear that it's continuing. I love hearing some of these behind the scenes processes um, of how the court works. Um, how does the court decide who will be the principal author of a decision? And the Chief Justice mentioned that you wrote so many when you first joined the court, and I'm interested to hear how that happened. Oh no, is this from you? It is. Uh, no, this camera. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I don't like talking to the press, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so your question is, uh, who decides? The chief decides, and I worked for three terrific chief justices, Malcolm Lucas, Ron George, and Tani Gantil Sakue. Uh, you couldn't ask for three better people, and I'm sure that uh, Chief Guerrero is following uh, right in line with their uh, outstanding uh, example, and um, everything I've heard uh, that uh, things are uh, well under control. But the chief really decides who uh, writes the opinion. The chief uh, will either keep it for herself or assign it to one of the associate justices. Between you and me, the ch the, all of the chief chiefs looked at uh, how much work you're getting out uh, and what kind of a backlog you have in your chambers. So it's, an, it's a very odd system. 
the more work you do, the more work you get. <laughs> this is a reward? No. <laughs> I, uh, I loved it. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the uh, people that I had the privilege of working with for all those years were just marvelous people uh, to uh, work with, and uh, it was a real pleasure. One of your biggest legacies has been some of your rulings and trainings with the legal community dealing with DNA evidence. Um, what are some of the biggest lessons you think the legal community has learned regarding DNA, and do you think there are still big concerns out there, or what are some big lessons perhaps that, that they haven't learned yet? Well, I uh, wrote People versus Barney when I was on the Court of Appeal. It was one of the first opinions in California dealing with uh, DNA evidence. What did I know about DNA? And that's the problem. Uh, these complicated cases come before judges who have little or no experience. Thank God I'm married to a scientist. Carol is a pharmacist. I had thousands of questions about how we deal with um, uh, DNA. So. Uh, Carol also comes from a science family. Her father was a physician. Uh, her other brother is a pharmacist. Uh, her younger brother uh, is also a physician. I don't know why they accepted a lawyer, but I thank them. Um, but scientific issues are difficult, and they're particularly difficult for judges and lawyers because none of us wanted to major in chemistry or any other science. But those scientific issues are really important for judges to have a clear understanding. So I gained that understanding by writing an opinion on the Court of Appeal and then being asked to teach it. First to California judges, then to judges in other states, and then internationally. I've taught in Canada, in Italy twice, in uh, Mexico, in China. Uh, but the capper was being invited by Princess Chulaborn of the Philippines, of, the, uh, of uh, Thailand. She's the youngest daughter of the then king and queen. She's a princess. She came to the United, the United States and got a PhD in, in genetics. She went back to Bangkok and opened a genetics institute She's a princess. She doesn't have to do anything, but she was working to update Thailand in the area of DNA. So she invited me to come to uh, Thailand to teach DNA to Thai judges. And I said, do we have to have an interpreter? She said, absolutely not. Everyone will speak fluent English. Can you imagine us going to any foreign country? <laughs> At any rate, they were very talented. But these scientific issues are so important, and Bob and I were going to talk about Sargon, mm -hmm. and that's one of the science cases that uh, I wrote, and involved uh, Sargon versus the University of Southern California, and it involved expert e evidence. Uh, now, I have to tell you, okay, the, uh, the, the, I, I was present when Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceutical was argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. And I got there through Justice Kennedy. When I wrote to the three justices uh, uh, at the end of the interview with Justice Kennedy, he said, Daubert is going to be argued today. Would you like to attend? I said, absolutely. So uh, he uh, had his locker, uh, locker escort me down to the courtroom. Uh, and I knew I was in a very important chair because on the back of it, it said with an engraved nameplate, Mrs. Kennedy. <laughs> I could read the notes of the people <laughs> on the podium, but uh, at any rate, in that uh, oral argument, one of the, uh, 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 oh, Judge Justice Blackman asked uh, the, uh, one of the attorneys, who is the author of Fry? Do any of you know who the author of Fry was? It's not even a U.S. Supreme Court opinion. It's written by Hosea Van Orsdale, 
from the D.C. Circuit. It's three pages. So you can understand why the U.S. Supreme Court had this complicated science summarized in three pages in Fry. So we had a people, we had a case uh, called People versus Kelly, um, and that was the uh, uh, law in California. Um, and I just tried in Sargon to add some meat to the bones to uh, make sure that our trial judges understood what their responsibility is in the area of uh, scientific evidence and whether or not that the expert is, uh, is qualified. So the, uh, that's a long answer to your question about why science is so important. I, I thought it was so important that I even introduced on the Judicial Council and the Continuing Education a science and law program. We had a four-day program at the Salk Institute. The subject matter was gene therapy and addictive disorders. I asked Marv Baxter, if we put on this program on advanced science, do you think anyone will show up? Marv said, Ming, you would be better off calling it science for dummies. We didn't do that. We put on, we had five world-class scientists teaching, we even took the judges into the laboratory and had them perform PCR DNA examinations. You give the judge a gavel and they can bang it like, you know what, but if you give them a pipette, their hands start shaking. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, one of the judges from San Mateo County wrote to me after that program and said, Justice Chin, that was the best continuing education program I have ever gone to. If you continue to put them on, I will pay my own way to attend. I said, I think we did a good job. <laughs> wow. One thing that's um, sort of fascinated me as a journalist covering the criminal justice system over the last several years is California's evolution on the death penalty, which used to be one of the biggest issues in judicial politics. Three judges were denied retention in the 80s over the issue. Now we have a governor who's declared a moratorium. There have been no executions. Um, and it's not really a major issue in debates about the judiciary or even state politics. Um, do you think that that's a change for the better? And do you think automatic death penalty appeals should end? I knew you would finally get to a question that I do not like. <laughs> um, the, the problem that it's created, and the chief uh, can either say yes or no, but the governor put a stop on all of that at the end of the line, but that doesn't stop the process that she still has to manage with her entire court, with the entire state's judiciary. So what are we doing? I, I, I'm glad I don't have to do it, but uh, I felt very strongly that the California Supreme Court should not have a backlog of death penalty cases. We have to decide them. Uh, when Governor Newsom took that off the table, he didn't take off deciding those cases. Justice Guerrero and her call, Chief Justice Guerrero and her colleagues still have to go through all of this, so somebody ought to find a solution to this problem. It's not going to be me. Uh, I think that uh, there, uh, I guess it's another referendum. I, I have no idea, but uh, it's, uh, the system is not working. Do you think there's appetite for another referendum anytime soon? Oh, I, I uh, do not get involved in, uh, in political discussions publicly uh, for uh, reasons. Uh, I did it so long as a sitting judge. When somebody would ask me a political question, I would defer it. And I said, it's really not appropriate for judges to get involved in political discussions. I guess I am just used to it. And my reaction at cocktail parties, somebody always walks up and wants to talk about a case. I said, I'm sorry, but I can't give you an opinion on that. 
because you would not want me to give you a cocktail opinion on the question that you just asked me. If I were deciding that, you would want me to review all of your paperwork and all of your exhibits and weigh and balance it. So I can't give you a cocktail party opinion. I am and was the most boring person at a cocktail party. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about a, a relatively recent case that I've followed pretty closely, um, and it's sort of upended employment law in the state. It's still playing out in the courts and in Washington, D.C., which is the Dynamex case, um, which spelled, is that how you say it? I've always wondered. Sure. <laughs> I always tell attorneys, say whatever you want, as long as I know what case you're talking about. I deal with typing it out all day and never have to say it out loud too much. Um, but it spelled out the rules for when someone can be considered an independent contractor, and it led to this wildly controversial state law, AB5, and one of the most expensive ballot measures um, of all time, in which gig companies successfully carved themselves out of the law. Did the court have any sense of how impactful or how political this would become at the time, and how do you see this playing out? I can tell you this. Uh, we did not talk, well, maybe I can't talk about that. I can tell you this. In all of my 24 and a half, well, actually, all of my uh, uh, appellate uh, judge years, uh, even the uh, six years on the Court of Appeal, I cannot remember any case where the justices in discussing the case talked about politics. One time at the Judicial College, uh, a judge uh, in front of all of the other new judges asked me, Justice Chin, what do we do about what is happening, happening in Washington? And I said, I recommend that you keep politics out of your courthouses. I recommend you keep politics out of your opinions. And I recommend you keep politics out of your discussions with anyone outside the judiciary. Judges cannot get involved in it. And the more, it, we, the, more the judicial branch gets enmeshed in that discussion, the worse it is and the less independent those judges become. I mean, look what's happening in Wisconsin. The, the, the third judge, that, the fourth judge that was just elected is being challenged because she made a comment in her election that she wanted to revisit the election process. And now they have a case on the election process. And now the other party wants to, her to recuse herself because she made a statement. We don't want to get involved in that. That's what degrades judicial independence. Uh, we really uh, should not be doing that. So I know you're the political editor, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am going to continue to uh, my uh, sworn oath that uh, I will not uh, speak ill of the U.S. High Court because I don't want the people who grade my papers to hear that I criticize their work. So I. I suppose I can't use that as an excuse anymore, but I'm still going to use it. Sure. I, but I'm still interested in whether, were you surprised by how kind of explosive this became? Um, you know, it was a seven, or it was a unanimous decision, so you were all united in it. Um, but just how it played out in the legislature, it's become, you know, wildly controversial. Did you, did you see that coming? Uh, probably not. We certainly didn't discuss it. Uh, but uh, uh, this case is pending before the California Supreme Court, so I do not want to talk about it any further. Okay. Um, I don't know how you're going to feel about the rest of these questions. Though. <laughs> Let's see. How much time do we have? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I suspect this might get a similar answer, but I'm still interested in your take. You're one of the three justices in the minority who voted against legalizing marriage for same-sex couples, and 
I'm assuming that um, kind of some of the reasoning that you just laid out applies to how you felt at the time, perhaps how you feel now, which is this idea of, you know, politics shouldn't infiltrate the judiciary. Um, I guess, what are your thoughts on the possibility of same-sex marriage being revisited uh, as suggested by Justice Thomas in the decision that overturned Roe? Are we almost out of questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, the, uh, the uh, same uh, answer, I'll, I'll give you an answer. Um, judges and legislators have a different role. Judges should not become legislators. The reason we leave those difficult public policy issues to legislators is because they are elected by a large majority of the population. The majority gets to vote on who those legislators will be and who that governor will be. The population doesn't get to vote on who those judges will be except in a retention election or or uh, sometimes contested elections for the uh, superior court. But generally speaking, you don't ask the general population about whether or not they agree or disagree with opinions. So, in those opinions, judges should not veer off and make broad pronouncements on major public policy issues that the public doesn't have a chance to speak on. Those two concepts are really important to separate judges from legislators, to separate uh, the major contested public policy issues. They should not be decided by judges. You, you bring your case before the court, the judge decide, the court and that bench decides only what you brought. Now, we sometimes look, as you're probably hinting, about whether or not it affects other cases, and that's an important consideration for judges. But judges should stay away. I mean, you wanted to know about my uh, processes and thinking. Judges should stay away from making public policy pronouncements that the public will never have a chance to vote on for that particular judge. Legislatures should be doing that. Now, many people will say, but the legislature isn't doing their job, so judges should, no, 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 no. Make the legislatures do their job. It's hard work, and I know that, but that's the way a democracy should work. We shouldn't have judges be legislators. You've talked about um, how you didn't discuss politics, you know, during, during many of these cases. Um, I assume it didn't factor into your decision making where the governor stands on some of these cases, but can you talk more about um, maybe some of the big picture considerations that you guys do make um, when you're either deciding whether to take a case or, or the process after oral argument? I'll, I'll tell you one that Dan brought. <laughs> And I think he brought it because I uh, talked about it in one of my speeches. I did a program for Dan, and uh, I think it was Dan's question. Uh, he said, uh, what do you think is the major civil rights issue of our time? Was that the question, Dan? Yeah. And I said, it's education, and it's a crime to have children locked in schools where they're not being taught and they can't get out. Um, so Dan brought a petition before the California Supreme Court saying that the legislature is doing, the courts should be doing it. Somebody's gotta fix the schools. You can't have kids in schools that aren't teaching. And I thought, well, he has my vote. Unfortunately, I could only get two other votes on the court, so Dan lost. But I still think it's the major civil rights issue. So if somebody has a bright idea of how to get that before, maybe we shouldn't talk about this anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway, Chief Justice Guerrero, uh, I, I really think that um, those kids in our schools, in the schools that you and I grew up in, where kids are stuck and they can't get out, uh, something ought to be done. But I'm not sure that it's the place of the courts. Maybe uh, the four other votes on the court uh, were right. Maybe it's not for the courts. It's for the legislature to do that. So, so I may have crossed the line on that vote, Dan, but I uh, told you uh, what my position was and I wanted to stick to it. But maybe we ought to stop talking about uh, personal cases in front of all these people. This is not being recorded, is it? <laughs> uh, I have so, sort of a broader question, so hopefully that will. Oh, good. Not about <laughs> politics? Uh, well. <laughs> You're I the don't... political editor. Of course it's going to be about exactly. politics. Exactly. Um, well, so I cover San Francisco, um, which obviously has been grappling with, you know, a lot of terrible conditions on the streets, um, with open-air drug markets. Um, some groups uh, recently suggested that they were going to start posting, you know, the sentences that some of the superior court judges were handing down in these drug cases and, and you know, publish them for the, the public to take into account, um, which is a pretty strange move, uh, I think. But, you know, as a journalist, um, we get bombarded with questions during election season um, from people who are kind of like desperate about information on judicial elections in particular, because it's very easy to follow the race for Senate. It's very easy to follow the race for governor. Um, what do you think is the best way for the public to evaluate a judge when they might not have heard of any of the cases that they've been involved in? Like, how, how can the public weigh a judge who's on the ballot before them? What are some of the resources that you would recommend? I can tell you what happens. All of my friends and neighbors call me. <laughs> me too. And they want to know <laughs> about this judge and that judge. And I'm always happy to uh, share what I, uh, and I, I know. But even, you know, sitting on the bench for 32 years, I had a very limited knowledge of the uh, work of individual uh, judges. So what is the best way? Well, I was the chair of the Commission for Impartial Courts that uh, Ron George uh, appointed me to. Uh, and actually, we had a whole section on um, elections and how people get information about judges and how, how uh, do how to handle it when judges are unfairly uh, attacked. and. Uh, how do, you, how do you get uh, information to the public, uh, or at least make information available uh, to the public about judges? So uh, they're started to be published in the uh, voter guide. Mm -hmm. Some of the information um, about the, the, at least the justices from the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court who uh, were on the ballot. So that's uh, certainly uh, one way to get information about the candidates uh, who, not, who may not be or are probably not well known uh, to the public. But it is a um, real problem. How do you get information to the public who needs it? And how do you make sure that it's accurate? Mm -hmm. That's always a problem. In, in, in the day of the internet, we're going to be deluged by uh, information. But how much of it um, uh, will be accurate? And, and I think that's. Uh, an important uh, process that the press has to pay attention to. Um, and I really wonder what artificial intelligence is going to do to that whole process. And, and who's going to be the gatekeeper about whether or not that information is accurate. So uh, Sarah, I hope you have some good ideas. <laughs> About I could sense you throwing this back <laughs> on me. <laughs> I mean, you're the dispenser of information. Uh, you have to make sure that it's accurate when it's uh, being reported by a trial judge who is under um, the microscope at, at a particular time in the campaign. That's an awesome responsibility. Um, and I would rather, I, I um, can't think of a better person to have that in the lap of because I know <laughs> that you will make sure that, you will try to make sure that what you print is, a, is accurate. Um, if you come up with ideas on how the court process can help you 
get that information, I'm sure the Chief Justice would love to know about it. And I'm sure the Judicial Council would love to know about it. Uh, we ought to be working collaboratively in making sure that accurate information is getting out to the public. Yeah. So I'd be happy to help with, with that. That's wonderful. It's, yeah, I, honestly, it's, it's the thing that people come to us the most for, and it's the most like little understood races and roles, and it's hard to be able to point people in the right direction. Um, I think I am essentially out of questions. Were there any big cases or moments through your career that you really wanted to talk about or get across um, when we're discussing your legacy? Oh, I was aghast when you said when Bob was going to talk about my legacy. I said, <laughs> this sounds like a eulogy. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be there. <laughs> So somebody, uh, I think it was Chuck Vogel, Justice Chuck Vogel from uh, Los Angeles, uh, said at some point in my career that he thought that my opinions were known for their clarity and their courage. I don't know whether that's true, uh, at least as far as the courage part of it, but I, I tried very hard to make sure that everything I put out was clear and concise and understandable. But I had the benefit of working with two preeminent legal authors. The first was Bernie Whitkin. Um, Bernie was uh, the preeminent legal author in California for years. He actually started the Judicial Council and the uh, seizure, the educational arm for judges. When I was appointed to the trial court, the PJ came up to me and said, Ming, what area of the law do you know least about? And I said, I've tried every kind of criminal case imaginable, and from drunk driving to murder. Uh, I've tried every kind of civil case imaginable, from contract to employment law to uh, even water law. I said, Mike, the only area I've never practiced is family law. He said, Ming, guess where you're going to be assigned? <laughs> so there I'm assigned to family law. And then he says, there's going to be a seizure family law advanced class taught on Monday. This is Thursday. I said, Mike, I have to wind down my practice. <laughs> There are a lot of things I have to do before I can get sworn in and go to a, a judge's class. And he said, well, if you don't go on Monday, you don't go for a year because it's only offered once a year. So I go to my partner, Fred Cummings, who was in Sandra Day O'Connor's class at uh, uh, Stanford. And I said, Fred, I have a problem. And he said, I don't, I told him what it was. He said, I don't think it's a problem. Just go to the class. You can come back after the class and wind down the practice. I said, Fred, I can't talk to the clients after I get sworn in. He said, that's OK. I'll tell them whatever you want me to tell them. I said, Fred, in the last 15 years, you haven't done anything I've asked you to do. <laughs> but we did it. Fred did it. And uh, we uh, wound down the practice after I went to this family law class. But I want to tell you about the family law class. It was the best continuing education class I have ever gone to up until that point in time. They had judges teaching other judges everything they needed to know about family law. I met Art Scotland in that, in that class. He was on the Third District Court of Appeal. Scotty and I are still working today on cases. <laughs> he re referred me to cases that are in front of <laughs> Justice Guerrero. Yeah. OK, we're going to stop talking. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that the. Uh, uh, continuing education part of it is so important for the judiciary that I participated in it during all of the years I was a, a, a uh, judge. I think we have the best continuing judicial education process in the country. And it makes our judiciary better because they are well informed, they are taught well by other judges. So. Uh, it's a great system. I know that it's uh, continued, and 
I think it's one of the reasons um, that the uh, California judiciary is the star of the country. And believe me, I know what the other states are doing because I have been to those other states and taught in their programs. I'll tell you just one example. I was invited by the chief of Wisconsin to come and teach DNA. In a room twice this size, there were no minorities. I thought, in a state like, like Wisconsin, you have no minority judges? I was astounded. So uh, at any rate, I uh, have enjoyed uh, uh, talking with you today. I'm just glad you're still awake. It's uh, been a pleasure. I want to thank Dan for arranging this, the, uh, the Historical Society for uh, sponsoring it. Uh, I met Dan in the governor's office uh, the day I was uh, introduced uh, to uh, the uh, press by uh, Pete Wilson as his, uh, as, as his nominee. And Dan, I want you to know that I got the call from the, oh, okay, I'll tell you, can I give you a brief? Oh, please. Yeah, we've got time. Um, I was here in San Diego for a meeting of the Judicial Council, the Appellate Committee. Um, Marv Baxter happened to be the chair of the committee. You remember he was the appointment secretary when I was appointed. So um, I go into the room and Justice Miriam Vogel says, Ming, come and sit next to me. I have some hot gossip for you. I sit down and Miriam says, I bet you the governor calls you within two weeks appointing you to the Supreme Court. I, I laughed. I said, Miriam, first of all, I don't expect to hear from the governor, number one. And number two, it certainly won't be within two weeks because it took him six months the last time around. So uh, I sit down next to Marv, and uh, the uh, employee of the hotel comes in with a silver tray with a note on it and comes up to me. It's the governor. <laughs> so I found out. Uh, uh, that day I talked to uh, Governor Wilson. He said, Ming, I told you two years ago that if I had a second seat on the court, I would appoint you. I now have the second seat. So if you're still interested, I'd be happy to appoint uh, you to the court. So the next day, Carol and I and our children, Jennifer and Jason, uh, flew up to uh, Sacramento for the press conference. We met uh, Dan, who was the legislative? Legal Affairs. Legal Affairs Secretary for um, Governor Wilson. So if you don't like my work on the court, it's Dan's fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I've got to say that uh, the insights, the anecdotes, the perceptions were just invaluable for any practicing attorney to hear. And I also would say that based on what you've heard from Justice Chin, you can see the truth of something that Justice Scalia said about the courts. He said, with the courts, the result does not validate the process. The process validates the result. And that is what a good judge does. It's the process that validates the result. Uh, and Justice Chin, is in your descriptions and uh, you're reminiscing, I mean, you really have shown how it's the process that you focused on in terms of determining what the result would be. One other thing I might say before I, I thank both of you is that uh, I don't know if it was Richard Posner who said it or not, but someone of his stature said, you know, the, the sorry state for a judge is when you're alive as a judge, you're remembered by your worst decision. And after you die, you're remembered for your best decision. So that is kind of uh, the, the sad, <laughs> you know, consequence uh, for, for judges that uh, the praise often comes, you know, once you're gone and people really recognize, you know, what you've accomplished and how you got there. I'd say that uh, as a result of today's session, we can be very proud and feel very good about uh, the sort of jurist we had on the California Supreme Court with Justice Ming Chin. So I want to thank Justice Chin, and I also want to thank Sarah Libby for coming and subbing, really, in 24 hours uh, in place of Baba Gelka, who spent uh, months preparing for this. So thank you, Sarah, and of course, Justice Chin again. Thank you very much. I think they are deserving of a real round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.
And while I have the floor, those of you who are not members of the California Supreme Court Historical Society, I would urge you to join. We provide three to four programs every year. They are MCLE programs, and they are free to our members, that, which makes the dues completely worthwhile just at that level. But in addition, we have a biannual publication, a legal magazine, The Review, that provides discussions about various cases, insights about the various judges. Uh, we then have a annual journal, California Legal History, which has a whole group of pieces, including abbreviated oral histories of the judges on the California Supreme Court. And in fact, is uh, we do oral histories now for every retiring uh, justice on the California Supreme Court. Uh, so your support is welcome. As I say, it's well worth the price. So just go to our website and hopefully sign up if you're not already a member. So thank you very much. And again, thanks to our panelists.